Are you happy to be in God's house today? Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm happy to see you. And if it's appropriate, give them a cuddle. Because God's happy to see you. God loves the thought that you are here in his house today. And thank you. Thank you so much for coming. We're, we're Mason and I, we're certainly loving getting to know you guys. And we're gradually getting around and visiting you. And uh, we appreciate your open homes. And thank you very much for sharing your space with us. I do plan on getting around and seeing every one of you. But if there's a matter on your heart, if you need a visit before I plan to get to visit you, please, please come and see me. Give me a phone call and let me know and say, Pastor, we'd just love you to come around and, and, and see us. And, and let me tell you, I will, I will get there as quick as I can. But we do plan on getting to see you all. You're important to God and uh, we will do what we can uh, to, to minister to you. Just let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we just pause now to thank you for being the great and marvellous God. We thank you for not only opening your sanctuary to us today, but we thank you that you've opened your hearts to us. You've opened your ears to us. You're tuned in to us. And I just pray that as we worship in your presence that I will be a worthy servant and give glory to your name. Bless now our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about something I know nothing about. Swimming. If Tony were here, I'd get him to come up the front because I know he does, uh, goes to the pool three times a week and does 15. Oh, he's there. You should be up here talking about this, Tony, but I'm not going to talk about swimming, but I'm going to talk about the importance of learning to swim, and I'm going to use that as a spiritual application, because let's face it, swimming is foreign to all of us. If you were to swim, you would have been brawn with scales, fins, or you would have had webbed feet, but God didn't make you that way. God made you that when you got to about nine months old, ten months old, all you wanted to do was walk, walk on land, not walk on water. So to swim, it is a discipline that you have to learn. Walking is natural for human beings to happen. We are made that way. But it's not natural for us to swim. And when you live in a place like Australia... It's a good place to learn to swim because you, you, water is so much a part of your life. Not so much in New Zealand, it's too cold. When we lived in the Solomon Islands, all we wanted to do was find cold water. Even the ocean was too warm. But yes, it's a discipline that you need to learn. And there are benefits in learning that discipline, but... The moral that I want to take from this is that you have to learn it. It's a discipline that is foreign to a human being. And because of that, you, you, you go on a journey of learning. You go on a journey of discovering. And once you've got there, you can enjoy the benefits of it. But you need to learn. Our little daughter, our youngest daughter, when she was 18 months old, said to our, her older brother, who was nearly 10 years older, said, Matthew, please teach me to swim. And she, he said, do you really want me to? And he, she said, yes, please. So he picked her up and she was in the middle of the pool in a matter of seconds. She made her way to the side and she said, I wanted you to teach me to swim. And he said, I don't have to. You already did. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about learning that kind of way. But it's how she learned, and she's been a good swimmer ever since. She had to. Just searching the net. I just found this, this, this little chart that identifies the benefits and that that come about by learning to swim. 
children learn the concept of reaching goals and overcoming challenges through learning to swim. Young swimmers are better prepared to enter school. They claim a lot of things here. I haven't checked up to see whether they're true or not, but they claim a lot of things. Children who swim are able to express themselves better. They're better in literacy and numeracy. I'd say that would be pretty hard to measure, but they claim that. They learn to count faster. They're superior at cutting paper. How they can work that out from being able to swim, I don't know. I don't know. But th these are the claims that they make. If you come up to physical development, swimming requires coordinations of arms and legs. Yep, I'll agree with that. I'm not a perfect swimmer. They develop gross motor skills. Some strokes require different arm and leg motions at the same time. Minimal impact on joints. Develop strength and cardiovascular health. So there's, there's some really good things identified there that become a benefit from learning to swim. And that's the same with any discipline that you step into. The moment you step into that discipline and you engage in that discipline, you become so much better at other things and able to do other things. Now today, I don't want to talk any more about swimming or else Tony would have to come up here. Um, I want to cross over now into a spiritual application. I want to liken the need to learn to swim to the need to learn to pray. This is one of the Christian disciplines that if we embrace can do more for us than anything else, can do anything else. And I'm, I know there's many here who will agree with me already. The power of prayer is a powerful thing. I've only been at this church a little while and I've already seen answers to prayer. God is working, God is powerful, God is doing wonderful things. I hope you don't mind, but I want to take you back to 1992 and I want to tell you the story of Selena. There was a knock on my door, my office door in the Western Pacific Union mission one day. It was the ministerial secretary of the union and he said, Peter, a special request has come through for you to take the week of prayer at the Burns Creek Church. I said, I'm here to run ADRA. I'm not here to, to take a prayer meeting. He said, well, they want, they've particularly requested you. I said, okay, who am I to argue with God? So I, I, I made my way to the Burns Creek Church and I've never spent a week talking about prayer and I thought well how am I going to do this there was a big blackboard eight foot by four feet 2.4 by 1.2 for the younger generation there was this blackboard there and I thought okay I'll wheel that blackboard out and on the first meeting I will ask for prayer requests okay so that's what I did I wheeled this blackboard out and I said to the people, okay, give me some prayer requests. And they did. So I started writing these prayer requests on the board. Very soon, there's not much room left on the board. And I said, what we're going to do is during the week, we're going to break into little groups and we're going to pray about these things. And as the answers come, we're going to rub them off. And they thought, good idea. I was just about to start to present the message of the night when this young boy walked in and he said, Master. They didn't call me pastor because I wasn't a pastor. They called me master. They said, Master. He said, Master, will you please put up on that board the name Selena? Okay. Would you like to explain why you want me to put the name Selena up on the board? The moment he told me the story, I was horrified. He said, Selena is a young lady that I've been studying with. She was going to be here tonight. She hasn't known anything about God until I started to study with her a couple of weeks ago. She was going to be here tonight. But just as she was getting ready to leave the house, 
She stepped out the back door of her house onto the landing. The landing gave way. She fell to the ground. The landing fell on top of her. She is now in hospital, unable to move from the waist down. Please pray for Selena. How would you go, folks? How would you go? We did. Every day for the rest of that week, we prayed. And we would rub names out on the board. We would rub these prayer requests out. We came to Friday night. There's only two meetings left. The only name on that blackboard was the name Selena. I felt we were going nowhere. I started preaching. I had been going about 15 minutes when there was a big commotion at the back of the church. A couple of cars had turned up and there was a lot of movement. People were now no longer interested in what I was saying. They were interested in the commotion out the back. And in a little while, there were these four strong guys escorting this young lady down to the front of the church. They had with them a whole lot of pillows and they put them on the concrete floor and this young lady sat on the concrete floor. I found out that that was Selena. After the meeting that night, I talked to her. She felt that there was some improvement but wasn't really confident that she would get the use of her legs. Man, I prayed hard that night. Sabbath morning, went back to the church, and at 11 o'clock began the last meeting. Selena is still the only name on that board. You can imagine what I was doing. While all the preliminaries were going on, I was praying. Just as I began to preach, those same cars came back. And this time, Selena shuffled her own way up to the front and sat on those cushions. I preached. I made the altar call. And without stretching this story at all, because preachers do have the license to do so but without stretching the story at all the moment I made the altar call Selena was the first person to her feet made her way 15 meters to the rostrum as if she had never had anything wrong with her body three months later along with 120 other people she was baptized Let's ask the question, why pray? Why pray? Let's not go fishing for answers to that question, but let's go to the Word of God. Let's go to the work, Word of God. Let's go to Mark first. Mark chapter 1. I hope you've learnt by now that you need to have the Word of God. There are some up the back there, and if you need one, please... Put your hand up and a deacon will bring it to you. We're not going to spend a lot of time with these texts because I don't have a lot of time. But we're just going to quickly go through these. Mark 1 verse 35. Notice what it says here. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left his house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Jesus himself becomes the model for prayer. If our Lord felt the need, how much more should we feel the need to pray? Let's move over to Luke. Luke chapter 22. 
Luke chapter 22, and here we read from verses 39 to 46. Here we are shifted into the darkest moment in the life of Jesus Christ. We've moved into the Garden of Gethsemane. Reading from verse 39, it says, And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt, knelt down and began to pray saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Verse 46, and he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Prayer is an exceptionally powerful tool. And when we engage in prayer, it will, engage, it will put a safety net around us and will Stop us wanting to be tempted. Let's have a look. Oops, sorry. Let's have a look at the next verse. First John 5, 14. First John 5, verse 14. First John 5, 14. This is the confidence of which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears it. So he not only tells us to ask, he tells us he will hear. This is our opportunity. Prayer is the opportunity to open the windows of heaven, the portals of heaven. It's our opportunity. We need to seize that opportunity. Let's go to an Old Testament passage. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 12, 23. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. If I don't pray for you, folks, I commit sin. Powerful as that. Straight as that. Scripture shoots straight. It is one of those ingredients, it's one of the tools of ministry that to be able to pray for others. And prayer, and when we do that and we're engaging in the life of other people, self kind of disappears. It doesn't become about me anymore. Oh sure, I'm an important factor, but I'm not the primary factor the primary factor is other people Ephesians 6 those of you who studied your lesson this week will have already looked at the heart of this passage Ephesians chapter 6 if my words don't match up with your words from the scriptures it's because I'm using the NASB translation Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 18. Here we're encouraged to put on this armor. And because you've looked at it in the lesson this morning, I'm going to just go to verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. 
And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petitions for all the saints. Prayer is not to be a haphazard thing. Prayer is to be a continual thing. Prayer, more than any other discipline, can keep us in the presence of God and help us to enjoy the presence of God. It helps us to persevere. It helps us to, to win the battle, if you like. You don't win a swimming race by diving in. You win a swimming race by getting out at the end. And we need to do that with prayer. And unfortunately, most people engage in prayer and, oh, this is not for me, and put it on the shelf and then wonder why their spiritual disciplines are falling apart. Let's go to Second Chronicles 7.15. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles seven fifteen. If if you want these, just give me your email address and I'm happy to send you a copy of the PowerPoint. They're not copyright, they're not I don't own them. They I'm welcome willing to share them and uh, happy to do so. Second Chronicles seven fifteen. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. If you pray, you get God's attention. Guaranteed. If you pray, the heart of God is open, the ears of God are open, and if you pray, you get his attention. You get his attention. The easy way to get God's attention is to engage in prayer. Let's have a look at one more as to why we should pray over there in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hebrews seven twenty-five. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Just as we are interceding, just as we are engaging, God is also interceding. Tell him what you want. He's going to sit up and listen. And he's then going to intercede in answering that prayer. But if he doesn't know what you want, how does he know what to do? How does he know what to do? So in summary, these are the things that we found. Why pray? Jesus did. Jesus did. We pray to help overcome temptation. Praying to God will stop your mind wandering into the unsafe places. We also pray to God to understand God's will. We pray for the sake of others. It is a weapon of warfare. And it's a powerful, powerful tool. It will defeat the enemy. From Chronicles, we learn that it will facilitate revival. It'll wake us up. It'll stimulate our own growth. Cause us to enter into a journey and get the benefits of that. And we learn from Hebrews that it gives us access to the throne room of God, the powerhouse of the universe. Great place to be, isn't it? In the throne room of God. How to pray. How do you pray? How should you pray? What should you pray? Well, 
We don't even have to guess the answers for this. These have already been given to us. Let's have a look in Philippians. Philippians 4. Beautiful chapter, one of the most beautiful chapters in Scripture. If you want a chapter that's going to give you a lot of hope and a lot of courage, read Philippians chapter 4. Here in verses 6 to 7 we read, Be anxious for nothing who's stressed out at the moment, whose life is not traveling where you would like it to be, who's got a few dark moments, dark patches on the horizon. Follow the counsel of the word. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just put it out there, folks. Just put it out there. There's no set script. Just put it out there. The Lord's Prayer gives us three basic principles. Acknowledge God, pray for others, and then let him know what you want. That's the basic premise of prayer. Acknowledge God, pray for others, and then put yourself in there and ask God to be with you. James 4, 7 to 8. James 4, 7 to 8. It's amazing. The guy who wrote this book didn't even believe who his brother was. The guy that wrote this book for a while thought that Jesus was demon-possessed. But the resurrection won him over. And in the crossroads of the Jewish culture and Christianity, he writes this beautiful book, packed with powerful information as the book of James. But verses 7 to 8 say to us, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So, unless you're submitting, prayer is of no value. You have to submit. You have to acknowledge that God is greater than you and that you are in need of him and you go into this submission. You submit wholly into the will of God and things will happen for you. Second Chronicles 33. Let's have a look over there. Second Chronicles 33. Second Chronicles 33 verses 12 and 13. When he was in distress... He entreated the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. When he prayed to him, he was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem, to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. When he was in distress, he prayed. A lot of people wait for the distress to pass and feel that they have to be in a good frame of mind to, to pray to God. No. When you're in that moment of darkness, just open up. You'll let it out. You'll pour it out. And it will flow from the heart. And this is what we're encouraged to do when he was in distress so those are the times to be praying to God. 
Hebrews 4, 16. A few texts I know that we're looking at, but I trust that when I give you a little illustration again, you will make, make sense of where we've been. Hebrews 4, 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. When you pray, never doubt. God's going to give you an answer. I can guarantee it. But has God answered every one of my prayers? I have to say no. Because he had the right to say no. And no is an answer. Just as yes is an answer. No is an answer. But sometimes, you know what? God takes another approach. He says, I like your prayer, and I love what you've asked for, but I want you to wait a little while. Because we've got a little bit of growing to do. We've got to be ready for when God answers the prayers. You know, a lot of times when we pray, if God answered, then God would shatter us because we're not ready for the answer. We're not ready for him to do what he wants us to do. And so sometimes he holds the yes a little bit longer than we like just so that he has grown us to be ready for that moment in time. Let's go to Luke, Luke 11. Luke 11. It's good to hear those pages of the Bible turning over. Luke 11, 1 to 4. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished one, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John also taught his disciples, and he said to them, when you pray. So is Jesus, uh, is Jesus meaning when you pray, pray these words? No, not always. Not always. This is a model of prayer. This is the principles of praying. This is what they are about. And this is how to engage in prayer. And Jesus gave the simple prayer, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted and lead us not into temptation. A simple prayer. Couldn't be more basic than that. Acknowledge God. Pray for others. Pray for the heart of God is what it's all about. One of the most important things to pray for is the attitude of forgiveness. That's what trips up most Christians, is the inability to be able to forgive. And not all the people that are going to hurt you are out there. Sometimes the people that are going to hurt you are in here. Don't stop coming because somebody here hurt you. Do what the Lord did. Pray for the ability to forgive. Pray for the ability to forgive. And forgiving heals a multitude of wounds. A multitude of wounds. Let's look at Romans 8.26. Romans 8:26 In the same way the spirit also helps our weaknesses It's a weakness to pray it's a weakness to be able to pray But notice what it says to us here in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with the groanings too deep for words. Friends, the Spirit's able to get in here. 
the spirit is able to understand what the heart wants to say to God. But sometimes our head and our heart are not connected. And sometimes what we say is not really what we're feeling or what, how, we are, how we're thinking. But God knows what needs to be said and so the Holy Spirit says what needs to be said and God understands that and God hears that. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. One more text, Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. Sorry we're stepping him through these quickly. I don't want to be to the discussion of lunch by saying the preacher preached too long. I'm doing the best that I can. I don't have a problem with Sabbath time. The sun doesn't set till sometime later today. I don't have a problem with Sabbath time, but I know there are people who, who like to be ruled by the watch. So I'll do my best. Jeremiah 29. Beautiful passage in Scripture. Verse 11 and 12, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Oh, God's got great plans. He just wants us to talk to him about them. He wants us to engage with him as he fulfills his plans. The summary is this. Philippians, pray about anything and everything. Just put it out there. Pray in submission. Pray with humility. Pray boldly. Tell God really what it's like. If, he, if you feel he let you down, tell him he let you down. You know what? A good way to pray to God is to pray Scripture back at him because he said it. Pray Scripture back at him. That's what Daniel used to do. He used to pray Scripture back at him. Pray like Jesus. Don't worry. Let the Holy Spirit interpret. And with all your heart, put it out there. Keep nothing secret. Open it up. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 to 10. This is one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. If you've never read the book, The Prayer of Jabez, get hold of the book. Sometimes it's quite hard to get. Get hold of this book, and I'll tell you what, it'll change your life. It'll do wonderful things for your life. But let's just go to 1 Chronicles 4. 1 Chronicles 4. And who's Jabez? Well, he's a nobody. He's just another person in the family lineup. That's all he is. And when you come into the book of Chronicles, most people won't read it because all it is is beget, 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 begot, beget, begot. That's all it is. Chapter after chapter, it's this person had this son, 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 keeps on going. And it's all like that until you get to chapter 4, verse 9. And all of a sudden, the guy that's going beget, beget, he drops something else in. And this is what he does. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers and his mother named him Jabez saying because I bore him in pain. We should all have, guys, we should all have the name Jabez because I think we all caused our mother's pain. But it just tells us that he was more honorable than his family and the rest of the people. Look at verse 10. Now Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, and here's the prayer. Most of your prayers are longer than this prayer. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my borders and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm that it may not pain me. That's his, that was his prayer. 
I don't know if he had 10 children or 20 children. I have no idea. But all he did, he prayed to God and he said, God, extend my borders. Don't harm me. In other words, God, do what you're good at doing. Look after me. Watch over me. Provide for my household. And look at the end of verse 10. And God granted him what he requested. I don't know if he got an extra 10 acres, an extra 100 acres. I have no idea. The story doesn't tell us that. All it tells us is that this man was an honorable man. In other words, he was willing to trust the God Almighty. In this lineup of people, he was most probably the only one who was willing to acknowledge God. And in being an honorable God, he hadn't been an honoring God, he had a need, and he said to God, God, this is what I want. And God said, okay, it's yours. That's it. Simple, isn't it? When was the last time you prayed like that? When was the last time you had the courage to pray like that? If you're having trouble praying and making it a discipline of your life, Get this little book, Steps to Christ. There is a chapter in here, The Privilege of Prayer. This is the little book that was given to me on the day of my baptism 46 years ago. I cherish this little book. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. This next sentence is a powerful one. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. The one thing we need in life more than anything else is to be elevated to be elevated from the pit of sin and to be lifted up to be where God is. Get his perspective of life. Get his understanding of all things and we will make sense of here. But if all we do is stay down here and don't rise up to be with him, this won't be a beautiful place. We can make this place much richer, much more beautiful when we engage in prayer. And I want to encourage you to engage in prayer. If there's anyone here that would like prayer, special prayer after the service, please see any of the prayer committee, the prayer coordinators. Please please see any of the elders. Come and tap me on the shoulder and we'll find a quiet place to pray. That is something we're going to offer you every Sabbath. From now on, if you need prayer, just tap us on the shoulder and we will meet you for prayer because we want you to plug into the power of prayer. Plug in. You've got to do something. you just got to plug in and turn on the switch. Father God, how beautiful it is to know that you're a God that wants to hear from us. How beautiful it is to know that you want to know what we're feeling, what our needs are. And Lord, you have opened the portals of heaven to receive our requests and to answer them according to your will. I pray, dear Lord, that from this day on, Alstonville, the people of Alstonville, the church members here are annoying you so much that you almost get to the point of being frustrated because you don't know what to do. Oh, Lord, just give us the strength to call upon your holiness, to seek your forgiveness, to seek your grace. May you bless this place because of the prayer that ascends to the courts of heavens. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.